Hi, everyone. So first of all, uh, thanks for inviting me to be here. It's a pleasure. I have to disclaim I'm a computer scientist, uh, so please uh, take my side of the things. So I think the previous panel has been a great uh, kind of uh, introduction to my talk because uh, from computer science and working on AI myself, so I have been working a lot on trying to align what I call machines, so models, and you will see I base my work on uh, deep neural networks and brain representations. Uh, what is a brain representation? So for me are neural patterns and activations that I get from fMRI, EMG, EMG EEG, and, and, and this kind of, of signals. So I, I would like to start also to give a bit of, con uh, of uh, context. So from machine learning perspective, and the computer science perspective, there's been a huge advance uh, on this modeling, uh, predictive model, models and so on, based on deep learning. And deep learning has been, as said, inspired by the brain as a metaphor, like very abstract metaphor of the brain, because we don't have a lot of the details, kinds of neuron synapses and so on, of course. Uh, but it's a kind of like mathematical concept that we can somehow map to what uh, we think an artificial neuron could be mapped to a biological neuron, for instance, right? And one of the, so deep learning has been there for many, many years, but it was not like the, the main trend for many reasons. Um, some of the reasons have been told already, so big data, big computational power, and so on and so forth. So there was this big data set that was um, open to the community, and then uh, deep learning was, uh, kind of tried there in a very engineered way. So you can see here some of the images. It's called ImageNet, and it's been used uh, for kind of learning the weights, the, the patterns of these models, um, that now they are the almost only ones and variations of them that, that are being used and are being researched. So here, just to see, like, before this uh, CNN, so computational, uh, convolutional neural networks, kind of inspired by the, the brain because of the receptive field sizes that only look at particular parts of the image. Um, so once they were introduced in 2012, so the error in this challenge, so this competition, was reduced by too much to ignore for the rest. So after that, everyone went to see how we can improve this kind of specific models and the rest was kind of left. Uh, on the side, and you see how the error went down. And of course, how they improved this uh, error or got better accuracy for this specific task, which is prediction which object is in the image, is by, you see here, different architectures, and these were engineered not to mimic the brain, but to win the challenge, and this is very important that we said this uh, from the start. So they made them bigger, deeper, wider, with uh, a lot of tricks, uh, um, optimization engineering tricks, and so on and so forth, uh, to learn better and stronger representations to be able to make better predictions uh, of object uh, categorization. So of course, uh, from the neuroscience side, then there was this new kind of model that was vaguely initially inspired by the brain that now suddenly also from the engineering perspective had very powerful representations that lead to very good predictions. So there was this drive of let's take back these models and see if we can make use of them. And here in one of these early examples that um, they aligned uh, the model representations and, and in this case macaque representations, so what they found is that even though those models were not in, uh, really designed to, to fit the brain, they could explain much more of the data variance than any other models that had been specifically theorized and designed for predicting brain data. So since then, there's been a lot of effort trying to also find uh, and use these models in, in conjunction to neuroscience to, to see what what can we learn from the brain with this model? So, so the, I see a lot of convergence between these two fields um, more than ever. And of course, many other fields and has been done before. So in this kind of uh, quest and endeavor, so one of the things that uh, we've been working on in collaboration with uh, uh, people from Berlin and also MIT is to set up this challenge, uh, which we call Algonauts, which is kind of like 
the, the quest for finding algorithms and models to predict brain data, and in particular, now we are aiming big data. So we set up some kind of standard and put it in some format that people can use their models to predict the data. And of course, um, so this year we are running the third edition, and it's still on if somebody's interested. Um, and, and one of the things that we've learned is that, of course, setting up a challenge is dangerous in the way that people tend to just uh, want to win the challenge, right? But on the other side, it also creates a bunch of predictions and, and, and sets a, 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 a dictionary, a set of models that then later on we can compare. And we can see what has this model that this other model doesn't have to make it better at aligning with the brain. Or what does this other model and this other have in common that make them uh, be the winners of this challenge, right? And I think then later on we can confront with the previous theories and then advance. So this is, this is the hope. It's, so the challenge is not the, the end, let's say it's, it's the beginning um, of, the, of the analysis and understanding. So along these lines, um, uh, we've been working also uh, about um, uh, going beyond object recognition in aligning brain and, and machine representations, um, always still in, in the vision domain. So one of the questions that we asked ourselves is, now we use these models to align with brain data and, and we got a, a lot of the variants of the data predicted with particular models that have been trained for, for instance, object classification. But can we also assess functions of particular brain regions by computing these relationships, correlates, or we can also use uh, predictions of its responses, so the responses of the models of the brain area to a large set of models with some constraints. So for instance, we have a large set of models that the only parameter that we change is the function that they have been trained on. So they are, are a kind of proxy for function. And then we, we can, we can maybe and build what's the functionality of particular brain regions. And we can do several tests on that. So just to give a bit more context, so imagine we have this set of models with only parameters, as I said, changing the function that they've been trained on. In our particular case, we focus on the visual cortex, so we use models that predict um, segmentation at the pixel level with category or not, they predict depth, they predict category at the global uh, picture level or which is seen it's there and so on and so forth. Uh, and then with the same stimulus set that we use to get activations of these models, once these models have been trained on another set, we also get the, the neural responses of different uh, subjects. And now what we can do is find which models in which regions predict better these neural responses. And then we can get either rankings of models per brain region, or we can also uh, do a searchlight approach and see if there is some pattern that emerges uh, uh, that we get which models are better predictive for each voxel individually. Uh, just to give a few technical details that uh, I'll just go very quickly. So what we do is uh, uh, we find this alignment with a representational similarity analysis, taking the layers of the models, because these are models that are uh, hierarchical with different layers. So we do a previous analysis to assess which layers are really relevant for the function that they have been trained on, because of course they, they are also very correlated, these models. Uh, and to finally get the ranking. So to do this, uh, in, in our experimental setup, we have our set of models that they have been trained on a, on a data set, large data set, of course, that's called Tasconomy. So the same images have annotations of different visual characteristics. As I said before, segmentation, object recognition, scene classification, 3D prediction, and so on and so forth. So this is a, a, a set of models and data. And then we have a disjoint set of images that are used to extract the activations from both the models and then get the, the neuronal patterns uh, from the brain. And this uh, was data that was not recorded in my lab. In my lab, we don't record data. Uh, this was done in collaboration with uh, Bonner from John Hopkins. <clears throat> 
So the kind of the of results that, that uh, we can see is that when we do this approach, the first thing that uh, uh, we can test is if with a searchlight approach, some pattern emerges. And it's not like a, a random pattern. And this is a, an unbiased searchlight, so we do the evaluation voxel-wise. And what we can see is that actually a pattern that is expected kind of emerges. So the, the blue colors represent 2D functions, like edges and so on, so it's in the early visual cortex um, mostly. And then we have the magenta, which is more uh, semantic information, like object categorization and so on. And then the, the 3D information, which is the green one, um, uh, emerges separately. So in a way, we, we can see that we have this dorsal ventral region emerging um, kind of validating all the previous literature um, that it's in there. Uh, with this more, some people told me, fishing expedition approach, if I might say. Um, another thing that we can also do is test actually the, the, the nature and predictive powers of these models uh, for each of the regions. So what you see in the x-axis are the brain regions that are localized with a brain atlas, um, B1 and so on, uh, with uh, LO and V3, well, so all the regions. And then we take the, the top three best predicting DNM, so the ones that have like the, the highest uh, correlation, and see how much of the variants of the brain data they explain. And the, the, the gray bars are the, the noise ceiling. So what we can see is that actually nine of the, of the tested uh, ROIs, we can explain more of the 60% of the variants um, of the lower noise ceiling, okay? So kind of showcasing that it's not only a method for finding functions, but it can also kind of uh, predict the variants of the brain data quite highly. So to sum up, so different regions in the brain explained by DNNs performing different tasks might be a method to kind of unveil which function each brain region might be performing. Um, and we are now also going to these multitask models and what is the relevance of integrating more information, even if we only test the visual cortex, for instance, uh, because we know that we have multiple uh, sensor inputs uh, that we might integrate the information somehow and it might have an effect. And, and with this kind of approach, one can systematically change particular parameters to confront the results and assess what is the importance of, for instance, integrating this other modality. So is the predictive power really increasing or not, keeping all the parameters and the rest of the parameters the same? Um, Okay, so some of the conclusions, so in our experiments we see that it matches the literature and, and that we can also explain uh, a lot of the, of the variants with this approach. Um, so here it's also to showcase that uh, this kind of framework is not only for fMRI, as I showed before, but it can also be mapped to EEG and by extension to MEG or also dynamic uh, neuronal pattern representations. So here what we did is take the same kind of stimuli and then record EEG data. So in this par particular case, we, we changed a little bit the question and since we did it ourselves, we had a bit more of control. So what we wanted to, to assess if um, the timing at which the visual features are processed compared to the navigational affordance. Uh, and to kind of uh, assess if the visual features would be then used for behavior, for instance. Um, so these are just details about the experiments that um, I, can, I can tell you later if you are interested, uh, but it's a typical uh, behavioral experiment uh, with, with human subjects. <clears throat> so here, how we map the approach that I explained before to the EEG data, so now, instead of having like voxels in brain locations, we have kind of like time windows across the neuronal patterns. And we then can do exactly the same approach uh, as we did before. So in this particular case, uh, we had a method to kind of compress all the models to only three categories, which are 3D representations, so 3D functions versus 2D versus semantic representations to also be able to have like some statistical power when we compare 
the, the different predictions and, and the unique variants explained by each of the models. Because of course, so one um, particularity of, of this approach is that if it's not driven by some theory or some kind of specific uh, models that you hypothesize and you just test all the models, then you don't have the statistical power to be able to make any conclusion. So this is also something very important to be taken into account. So here you see some of the, of the results that, that we got. Uh, so you see the, the unique variance explained by all these uh, 2D function so models that uh, are trained for, uh, for 2D functions, 3D functions, semantic, and NAM is the, the behavioral uh, affordance model. So this was a behavioral model uh, in which people assess which path uh, were uh, possible to navigate to. And what we can see here um, in this result is that the VN strain on 2D functions uh, shows the earliest peak, followed by the, the ones that are trained on 3D and then very closely related to semantic in timing. And then the peak of the, of the navigational affordance model is the, is the later. So what we propose here is that this suggests that the visual features are processed before navigational affordance in the human brain. So just to uh, summarize uh, both of the, of the works that I presented, so this correlation, and I have to say that I say correlation beco because we used representation similarity analysis because of the data size that we had, but this could also be done by a why is, but what is called encoding models, which are more predictive uh, with more data. So this correlation between the uh, deep neural networks with brain areas, taking fMRI uh, data and time responses and the neuronal patterns, taking the EEG data, um, highly depends on the task that the, the DNNs uh, were trained on. And of course here, again, so the data that the trains were trained on were the same for all the tasks. So this is a factor what we took out. And we also took care that this data what was of the same distribution as the images used uh, to show to the, to, the, to the subject. So both were indoor scenes, um, which is also another factor that was also discussed before. So these DNN models can be a potential alternative to gain insights for, assess, for, for assessing brain areas function. I don't think they are the absolute replacement. So it can give some ideas to maybe come up with new theories and make new experiments, new hypotheses to be tested. So it's, I see it more as a complementary approach, um, that it's more scalable as well with more data and we can confront uh, several data sets from different labs, for instance. Uh, so as I said before, uh, we are part of this Algonauts project, so we are um, considering also other FRI data sets also for this approach and more complex tasks. Um, <clears throat> in conjunction to this Algonauts project, we are developing a, a toolbox that we call net to brain and it's to facilitate this intersection between machine learning and cognitive neuroscience. So what we, uh, we did is, is uh, we provided a framework that provides this uh, functionality, so this um, this framework for comparing representations of deep neural networks and brain activities, and it's uh, open source, and we also get all the time feedback and try to incorporate it from the community. And mainly it has uh, in place this, this uh, method in which we have more than 600 DNNs there in place, and now we are trying to build a, task, a, a, a taxonomy of DNNs to be able to guide also um, which kind of DNNs are relevant for my question uh, from a cognitive uh, science perspective, which I think is very challenging. Uh, so we have a lot of them already in place, uh, very easy to extract features, then we create RDMs, so the representational dissimilarity matrices to then be able to compare to the, to the brain RDMs. But we also, besides representational similarity analysis, we also have uh, linear encoding uh, models in place. So finally, uh, just uh, let me tease you again on this Algonauts project, because as I said, there is still time for uh, submitting your models with our data, which is actually not my data, but this is in collaboration with Kendrick Kay, 
Uh, it's the natural scenes uh, data set, and it's going towards these big data, uh, trying to, to, to build encoding models and, and then be able to compare all the participants' models and, and have some kind of, of ranking. Yeah, so with this, uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. We have time for one or two questions. No? Oh. Yeah, I'm not sure if this is a coherent question, but um, it seems like you're, you're, you're starting with the assumption that your different models have different regions of expertise and you're expecting one model to be the best at a particular voxel or something. But somehow I'm wondering, well, but wouldn't you want to maybe combine? Like, can the models combine synergistically to sort of explain more? Yes, and I think this is a great question, and I didn't emphasize it enough, I think. So, so here we picked the model that predicted highly in each uh, particular voxel, and for that we, we, of course, the representations are somehow also, between the models are somehow correlated uh, because they've been trained in the same um, data set and so on, but we selected the layers that were more disentangled. Uh, but here, for this prediction, we found that selecting the, combining the three top models where was uh, giving us the highest predictive power. And one of our, uh, I would say at this point conjectures, uh, so con conjectures is that, or, or maybe hypothesis we could test it, is that maybe it's not the particular function that we have in our dictionary that is particularly relevant, or maybe it's just because this function is really, I, this particular brain region is really uh, performing more than one function, so, so we could have both ways. We don't know, it's, it's just, uh, uh, yeah, probably we should test it further. Um, thank you for the talk. Uh, you mentioned uh, several times that you are mostly looking at the visual system. Uh, can you say a few words about what is uh, needed in, in, in your opinion to move uh, uh, towards other brain regions and brain systems? Yeah, so actually, so um, we started with the, the visual uh, cortex because it's the one that is more studied. And first, to provide this kind of framework, we wanted also to confront to the literature. Um, but I have a collaborator that uh, she's working on language, and she is using similar approaches, but taking, for instance, models and then perturbing them and then doing the comparison. So what's the role of this particular uh, function of, of the model? Uh, uh, even using models uh, similar to GPT and so on. But, but you can have some interesting questions, like, for instance, what happens if you take um, some grammar structure out? Or what happens if you ablate this part of the model that you know what is doing? And, and these kind of questions, I think, can give relevant insights. Thank you very much for the intriguing talk. Thanks. <laughs>